Um, hello, and welcome to all of you joining us for the fourth of the Japan Studies Association Staying Connected webinar series. We realized fairly early on that the COVID pandemic would make it impossible for us to gather as usual in Hawaii for our annual conference. However, through the wonder of Zoom, a technology in which we are all now extremely expert, uh, we realized it was possible to gather and enjoy each other's company with a series of presentations furthering the mission of the JSA. Before introducing today's guest, I need to thank my program co-chairs, Andrea Stover and Maggie Ivanova, and of course, Joe Overton, JSA president, for their assistance bringing this concept together. The board of the JSA, Stacia Bensel, Faye Beecham, Jim Peoples, and Dawn Gale also provided much help and advice. A double shout out goes to Dawn Gale for helping us get support for our program from the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies and for hooking us up with Jody Dietz, coordinator of Johnson County Community College's Collaboration Center, uh, and Sarah Bayos and Isaiah Reesby, who handle the technical aspects of our program for us. So thanks much to all and to all of you for joining us today. Today, we're departing somewhat from our usual format. We are making this more of a conversation with Fukunaga Takeshi. Uh, he is writer and director of the film Ainu Mojir. Uh, but fear not, we will endeavor to leave time uh, for questions at the end. So why don't I get straight to the introduction? Uh, Takeshi Fukunaga uh, is a filmmaker born and raised in Hokkaido, Japan. Having lived in the US for 16 years, he moved his base to Tokyo uh, back in 2019. His first feature film, Out of My Hand, premiered at the Berlin International Film Festival in 2015. It won the U.S. Fiction Award of the top prize at the LA Film Festival and was nominated for the John Cassavetes Independent Spirit Award. His second feature film, I Knew Mosier, uh, won special jury mention at the Tribeca Film Festival and best film at the Guanajuato Film Festival in 2020. Uh, Fukunaga-san is currently developing his third feature project, which is set to shoot uh, this summer. So welcome, Fukunaga-san. I'd like to begin by asking you to talk a little bit about your journey, uh, what brought you to the U.S. initially, uh, and what brought you to the subject of your first film, uh, and how all that led back eventually uh, to Hokkaido. And, um, first of all, thank you very much, um, JSA, uh, Paul, and then all the team behind JSA for having me. I'm, uh, I'm happy to hear to talk about the film and then I hope this conversation will be something interesting for the audience. Um, so, you know, as you know, you introduced me, I was born and raised in Hokkaido, but then uh, soon after I graduated from high school, I decided to move to US to study abroad. And, um, you know, the main reason was, you know, I grew up in a small town in Hokkaido and then wanted to see uh, the world and then um, and then learn about different cultures and perspective you know like uh, Japan is has many wonderful things but also other not so wonderful things you know uh, mm -hmm. to me as a as a adolescence you know teenager like it, that kind of a group oriented mentality was um, wasn't very comfortable so I wanted mm -hmm. to see almost like you know and then in the U.S. when you look at the U.S. culture it's more of a individualistic uh, culture, you know, mm -hmm. of course that has also has both sides, but I wanted to see the kind of totally different kind of culture. Mm -hmm. um, and my first feature, so, so after, first I went to actually Minnesota for two years, for my first two years of college, and then moved to uh, New York to study film. And after uh, I graduated, I was looking for a subject for my first feature. I, it took me a while to finally to start um, uh, working on it, but I always wanted to tell an um, immigrant story as, you know, of course I was one of them. And then I um, kind of by luck, uh, I, or by chance, I, um, you know, found this subject matter, which was the lives of uh, uh, workers in rubber plantation in Liberia, uh, which is of course different from my background. I was involved with uh, this like a, a documentary project with the same that kind of uh, subject matter, and was very very um, inspired by how you know raw materials or something we use every day is 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 at the cost of you know uh, um, you know many uh, you know you know like a heavy work of these workers, and then there's you know um, there are many like issues uh, you know surrounding it. And then mm -hmm. I thought, you know, combine by combining 
uh, that world, you know, Laban Pratish in Liberia, and then also the immigrant story in New York would make it, you know, uh, shine the light on this particular issue. And then also kind of a, a tell more of a universal story on the universal mm -hmm. message that, you know, there's always a story behind uh, we encounter uh, every day. And then there's also, you know, things, uh, uh, other, the world, you know, um, you know, behind the daily product we use every day. And, mm -hmm. and so that was uh, uh, initial motivation. And then having made it, I saw, you know, maybe it's time to go back to my, you know, where, where I'm from and then to, to learn more about Ainu and my, uh, the land I was born into. Um, and, uh, so, you know, you know, I can talk, you know, more about animals here, you know, after this, you know, more conversation, but, um, so, but that was, that was the initial kind of like, um, uh, steps that I took. So, but having the chance to get out of Japan and out of Hokkaido kind of prepared you for yes. coming back and seeing things in a new way. Yeah. Yes. So uh, let's talk about now uh, Ainu Mosher, um, which translates as Land of the Ainu. Uh, let's start by taking a look at the trailer uh, for the film. Um, I'd also point out that we have uh, a link to uh, the film uh, via Netflix uh, on our JSA webpage, japanstudies.org. So let's take a look at the trailer, please. Okay, um, so now I live in Alaska. Um, I'm an American. However, um, while we have a good simulation of American civilization up here in Alaska, it's not the same as it is back in the lower 48, the continental US. Well, I suspect you have similar issues trying to explain Hokkaido uh, to outsiders. So can you talk a little bit about ho how Hokkaido is and is not like Japan. Yes, well, then I would start by the, the history of Hokkaido, you know, like, um, so Hokkaido, um, well, there are a couple of different uh, names for it in, in Ainu, but one of them is Ainu Mosir, you know, land of Ainu. So mm -hmm. as, uh, as that word says, the Ainu people, you know, is indigenous to the land and has been here uh, since the beginning. I mean, they were, they also, you know, uh, used to live in Tohoku area in Honshu mm -hmm. and then, you know, it's, and then like a south of, you know, Russia, mm -hmm. but, um, but Hokkaido was supposed to be uh, the main, you know, uh, um, their main, the main area they've been, uh, they were, uh, they inhabited it. And then, but uh, starting from like 14th century, uh, Japanese people started, um, you know, settling in, in the south of Hokkaido and then taking over the land. And then through, you know, this, you know, rest is the same as, you know, what happened with all the indigenous people around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, many, many wars between Jap Japanese people and Ainu people. And it was um, in 19th century, um, in the beginning of uh, Meiji period, the, uh, the Japanese government um, started, you know, sending out many, many settlers uh, to Hokkaido. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the, that kind of like a national um, um, strategy to protect the land from Russia. And so, and then, so when the, the, the bulk of uh, settlers, or I should say like ancestors of most of Japanese people living in Hokkaido now uh, was, were gathered from all, you know, all over Japan. 
Mm. So in a way, you know, they, you know, each one of them have a different culture, different customs, and then they, you know, it, in, and then it kind of, and then after, you know, uh, mingling with other people from other uh, regions, you know, uh, they're, in a way, they're, um, I, wouldn't, I shouldn't say diluted, but they're, you know, they, they started having a different kind of culture. Right? Yes, yes. Like, like uh, I guess, like uh, many settlers from Europe to US. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, for the Japanese people, it has a shorter history. Uh, so that uh, uh, translates into many things, you know, how, you know, the kind of customs we have, and then, you know, like how maybe Japanese people, uh, Hokkaido people often, sometimes people say, uh, the Hokkaido people tend to be, I guess, a little more tolerant or generous or not so picky about small things because we have, you know, rest history or not so uh, holding on to the, the, the wrong history or wrong culture, cultural customs mm -hmm. and so, so forth. Um, so now, of course, it's, you know, Japan is a small country and then, you know, there's no such like, a, you know, um, prejudice or, you know, stereotypes so much, mm -hmm. but, you know, you know, back in the day, there are some uh, people in Honshu who would kind of look down on, you know, uh, people in Hokkaido because, you know, because of that kind of history. Um, but, um, but today, you know, again, you know, there is, you know, um, no kind of divide between the Hokkaido people and then the rest of Japan. But uh, I know people are still here. And then that's something uh, people don't know enough about. Um, like, for, for example, this, so that was a main, uh, one of the main motivations uh, for me to make this movie, Animals Here, um, because the, the, um, they're still very much underrepresented in the Japanese society today. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, if, especially if you talk, talk about their representation in media, uh, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's still, you know, uh, it still has so much work to do. Mm -hmm. uh, this movie um, is supposed to be the first uh, narrative fiction film um, about Ainu, starring Ainu people. Mm. Uh, there are a few films, few fiction films that are, are made about Ainu, but every time it was made, uh, it was a Japanese actors, professional actors who are playing the role of Ainu, which mm. is of course not acceptable today's standard. But mm. um, Japan still is in a way outdated, you know, as far as that kind of you know, um, including, you know, diverse voices and then, you know, being paying this, you know, respect, you know, to those uh, voices. And then, yeah, I hope to make, make a step, you know, for, for that. Well, so on that note, um, I would uh, wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the setting for Ainu Mosir, uh, the village of Akan in Eastern Hokkaido, and especially uh, talk about the actors that are featured in your film. Yeah, so, so Ainu, um, of course, you know, used to be living in all over Japan. Uh, today, you know, it's so the assimilation, you know, um, uh, the forced assimilation, you know, which happened over the years. Um, um, the, I mean, it, it's hard to draw the clear line, but the population mm. of Ainu is supposed to be not uh not very large you know like that the, one of the research said you know it's it's about um like 13 thousand uh people although again you know like it's it, it's very hard to draw the clear line so mm -hmm. it's just uh it's just a one example but um so but there's a couple like um areas that um you know a group of like a big group of Ainu people are living and then Akan is one of them uh, mm -hmm. Well, although the size of the town is very small, it's a, a little over 100 people, Ainu people living there, mm -hmm. but, um, but it's, it's a very um, well-known Ainu uh, area um, for as far as like Ainu uh, culture and then like their, um, you know, um, their, their the other activities because it's, it's, um, it's mostly known for the tourism. And then, I mean, since the beginning, uh, like uh, the town was built for tourism, like, you know, a bunch of group of people, you know, gathered from different areas and then started the town to 
to make a living uh, by doing tourism. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's the beginning of it, and then that's still uh, how they how they you know um, make their livings in in that town, like like it's portrayed in in the, in the film. Mm -hmm. And then all those, um, except, uh, you know, the one, uh, there are no actor who play the father, uh, everyone, well, and then also the band member, uh, Oki, um, everyone who appeared in the film are basically, uh, is basically playing a version of themselves. So mm -hmm. they are all uh, actual Aino people who are uh, living in that town. And, um, and then I, I chose that town because it, it's um, it, the what that town represent says so much about the state uh, current state of Ainu, mm -hmm. how you know they they are trying to find a way to you know stay Ainu in a way like you know to to hold on to their identity, but while you know uh, there are so few um, uh, ways for them to basically live. You know, um, make a living by being Ainu in a way, and then that and one of them is a tourism. Uh, so I guess that's kind of a general idea of you know what the town is, and then the no actors. Okay, um, so I think this would be a good uh, chance to take a look at uh, a uh, segment of the movie. So if we could play the uh, rain uh, video, please. あんたお前暗い顔してるぞ。そう。うん。ほっとけやな。で、顔いっぱい立てんのばして。で、その後な、ここにな、顔中全部集めな。やんないね。いいからやってみれ。ほ。くちゃ。それから So I'm curious in a situation like this, what comes first, the story or the cast? Well, so did you have a story and then you just kind of found people who could play it or did you find people and build a story around them? Um, um, it's kind of like, simultaneous process i mean like so i had a story in mind but um it's um you know i wrote the script you know it's a it has you know it, it's working with actual people but you know at the same time it, it's a fiction film you know mm -hmm. um at the end of the day so i had a script uh that i wrote um thinking those people in mind you know um so but then, you know, like, so I, I, the script had all, you know, lines and the scenes and everything, but mm -hmm. I didn't, um, I didn't ask them to memorize the lines, but mm -hmm. instead, you know, I, of course, there are certain parts that they had to, um, you know, uh, hit to, to tell the whole, you know, whole story, mm -hmm. but I um, try to give those, you know, um, non-professional actors to, uh, space, uh, uh, a space to be for them, for them to be able to, uh, you know, express themselves mm. in, in uh, however they, they, you know, they want. And then that was very important to first to bring out their natural uh, performance, but also to not to avoid uh, imposing my uh, preconceived notions about Ainu and then who they are. Mm. Um, you know, I'm a uh, I, I, I was very aware that I'm a Japanese filmmaker making a film about Ainu. Mm -hmm. and, and then so, so that, was, uh, that was a very important uh, step. And then um, to, 
you know, like how what the kind of process I take, you know, was was very important to to be um, to make a film that fairly represent you know who they are and then you know um, uh, their voices. Mm. So, uh, and that is another way in which uh, Alaska is like Hokkaido in that um, this enduring presence of its indigenous peoples. Uh, we have five major uh, indigenous cultural groups here uh, and preservation of indigenous culture, language, et cetera, uh, is a major concern. So um, can you tell me a bit more about your experiences working within uh, this Ainu cultural context, what that was like? Yes, um, you know, first of all, I, so I, you know, again, like I was born and raised in Hokkaido, but there was so, I didn't really have a chance to learn about, about Ainu. I mean, mm -hmm. there wasn't any, well, it's changing now, but, you know, mm -hmm. in my time, there wasn't really any proper education about Ainu or uh, the, the history or the culture or any of it. And, uh, but I was, although I was always very curious, but because of the, uh, the history of forced assimilation and then uh, racism and uh, that happened in the past, um, it almost felt like taboo to to really talk mm -hmm. so much about Ainu. Mm -hmm. Again, now it's changing, but um, but then you know, as as I said earlier, after I made my first feature, I was like, okay, so I, you know, or like I should say, experience of living in U.S. you know made me to. Um, made me aware that I don't know, didn't really know anything about Ainu, and then I should know. And so, you know, uh, starting the project, uh, this uh, Ainu Mosir project was a way for me to learn about, you know, uh, Ainu. Mm -hmm. And and then so I started by just, you know, going to different towns and then meet as many Ainu people as possible, and then to hear uh, about their experiences and, and then learn about them. And um, so, and then even after I found the location and then, you know, actors who play, you know, um, played in the movies, uh, you know, there are the, the learning process of learning uh, about Ainu or who they are was, was you know, was always, you know, um, continuous, you know, because there is an, there's never enough, you know, uh, to, mm -hmm. you know, there's always more to learn mm -hmm. about them. And then I think one important lesson I've, had which i think could um which i, I think is, is is a lesson uh that i think i can take for for anything but um so because i was you know fascinated by the Ainu culture and then the early on uh, wanted to uh learn about them i thought you know like like learning about dancing or knowing about you know dancing or singing or culture or and practicing those you know, ceremonies and those things are all always a great things and then always a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like if if I meet an Ainu person, you know, I would just kind of automatically just, you know, be very impressed by, you know, like, you know, what they do or, you know, the thing just find it, you know, fascinating and then and then always think it's a, it's a great thing that they're practicing and that they're trying to preserve their language or culture and but then, uh, and then realize I, you know, after I met kind of younger generation, but I knew and how they sometime, you know, uh, don't necessarily want to preserve the culture or take all the responsibility mm -hmm. for those issues. Because, you know, of course, you know, if I was told uh, by someone that, uh, okay, this is the only thing you should do, or this is the best thing you can do, then it will be suffocating. And, mm -hmm. and then I unintentionally I was thinking that that's always a beautiful thing and then which wasn't true and then they you know of course that's that's a that's a serious issue that's a that's a uh, important thing we should keep talking about but mm -hmm. at the same time you know it's uh, each each and every one of uh, I know person um, has of, of course they have you know uh, uh, has their choice uh, to mm -hmm. you know uh, what to do with their uh, cultural heritage Mm -hmm. And then that that's such a simple thing, but I, you know, like just meeting many people and then listening to them, you know, made me realize I, un again, unintentionally, sometimes I still have some, uh, you know, like kind of forcible notion. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. So I think this is a, a good 
uh, time to take a look at our final clip um, showing part of uh, a festival ceremony taking place. So one of the things um, that you talked about that I found really fascinating, which once again is similar to uh, Alaska, is um, within uh, Alaska Native uh, cultures here, it's both the privilege and the burden for young people to carry on that culture. So in the context of the, the ceremony that we just watched, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, this ceremony, uh, you know, again, like as I said earlier, the, the whole town was started out, uh, you know, as, as as a place to for them to uh, to uh, to make a living by you know, tourism. So mm -hmm. this one of the reasons how so this ceremony was started in back in uh, 1950, and uh, I mean, like initially it was a way for them to you know, uh, pay respect to, to the nature, you know, as, as you know, the nature is, is a very important part of their culture and then, you know, philosophy. Uh, but then it became uh, um, more of an um, um, activity to draw more tourists too. And then, of course, it's, uh, you know, at the same time, it's for, you know, Ainu people from around the, you know, Hokkaido to gather and, and you know, and celebrate together as well. But it, another side to it is uh, it's a, it's an event uh, for for tourists also, <laughs> and but um, but in today there are a few uh, big events you know like that uh, for for um, many other people to gather, and then this is supposed to be actually uh, the biggest uh, event for uh, for Ainu people uh, where. You know they can come together, and then you know after they did this uh, like a march, and then you know uh, prayers, and then dancing, singing, uh, mm -hmm. they go to you know uh, uh, they stay at a, a hot spring you know, a hotel, and then they have this their own party. Uh -huh. So there's yeah, so there's a tourist um, event, and then after that they they have their own after party, and then that's what they really looking uh, looking forward to uh, mm -hmm. every year. But um. But yeah, the, the, the question about, you know, uh, the, you know, um, the preservation of culture, you know, and, but also, you know, um, like preservation of, in a way, like uh, identity is a, is a very um, um, serious issue. And then I think, and again, uh, personally, I think at the, at the end of the day, you know, we just have to 
um, remind, keep reminding ourselves that, you know, um, in the end, we are, we are talking about, um, we have to tackle on this, these issues collectively, and then not in, instead of like imposing that responsibility on particular group, not, and then, mm. so this is not just like, uh, you know, issues for Ainu people or any other you know, indigenous people, but this is an issue for, you know, the, a global issue that we should all, you know, mm -hmm. um, think about. And, mm -hmm. and then any, any individual shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't feel, you know, um, forced to, to take a responsibility on that. Mm -hmm. So um, the critical reception to the film has been extremely enthusiastic and complimentary. Um, did the film live up to your expectations? Uh, is there more to that story that you wish you could tell? I mean, uh, well, as far as reception of the film, you know, has been wonderful. I mean, like, uh, I was especially uh, happy to see, um, you know, other people, especially, you know, like uh, people in Akan mm. were very happy about it and then were... Um, you know, they just keep, you know, talking about the film, keep talking about others to, um, I mean, keep introducing the film to the others. And then, you know, how, how they told me that, that they are happy that, you know, again, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a finally a, a much better representation of, mm -hmm. you know, of who they are in, in, in film or any media. Mm -hmm. And so, and then aside from that, I was happy that, you know, like so, it's it started playing in theaters in Japan. E even this under COVID situation, theaters are still open uh, in Japan. Uh, so the, it opened in uh, theater in Tokyo back in uh, October last year, mm -hmm. and then it's play, has been playing uh, um, at theaters in different parts of Japan. Uh, it, now it's uh, went over sixty theaters and still counting. And so the and then. Um, you know, as I say, there are still uh, very few uh, places or um, or chances for uh, Japanese people to learn about Ainu. And mm -hmm. if you ask any uh, Japanese person if uh, how much they know about Ainu, they they would be most of them wouldn't know much still mm -hmm. you know, today. So this uh, film became kind of a um, uh, um, you know rare opportunity for them to. You know, uh, learn more about them, and then I was I was very happy to provide that uh, um, uh, chance. And then you know, also, also even though, you know, it could have, you know, the, the for example, like a festival, film festivals, you know, uh, many of them were either cancelled or extended. Mm -hmm. So in, you know, in in a in a regular year, it, it, this film would have would have been going to different theaters through you know all over uh, the world. But it didn't happen so much. But thankfully, you know, um, uh, Ava DuVernay's company, RA, distribution company, RA, uh, took this film and then released it on Netflix starting uh, last November. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, of course, there are things could have been better, you know, if if not for, you know, uh, if it wasn't uh, in COVID situation. Mm -hmm. But I'm still very happy. Uh, and then uh, that how people responded to it. And, and then as far as uh, other stories about Ainu, or uh, of course there, there's, there's a, um, there, are, there are countless stories that uh, mm -hmm. you know, should be told. But um, I'm actually currently developing a documentary project about Ainu in a in different town. Uh, and that, I think that would be, you know, uh, the, you know the, the last one, you know, a last project for me about Ainu for a little while, but, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would always be happy to tell more stories if I can uh, be a help. Mm -hmm. and, and, but if I do so next time, you know, like if I make a fiction film, I think I would have to try to get, uh, Ainu, uh, you know, people more involved, like creatively. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote the script in, in, with a huge help from like a uh, devil sound and many uh, mm -hmm. people in Akam, but, Next time, I think, you know, I would like to, you know, uh, make them involved even more, you know, mm -hmm. as, for example, like as a co-writer or something, because that way we can make a step forward, you know, for that, um, uh, the representation of, mm -hmm. you know, I know. 
Ah, wonderful. So what I would like to do now is I would like to invite uh, the members of our audience uh, to uh, bring their questions. So if you could write something in the chat function, which we already have, but um, could you tell us a little bit about your, you say you've got a project that's going to be going this summer. Could you talk a little bit about that while we rally folks uh, their questions? Yes, uh, that would be a very um, interesting challenge for me. Uh, it, it's um, so my first two films I worked with so-called non-professional actors, meaning you know, um, you know, uh, of course they are great performer. They are at the same time they are regular people. Uh, but the next one is a lot more fiction uh, in the sense that uh, working with professional actors, but also it's a, it's a period piece that takes place in uh, Tohoku uh, area, and it's based on old uh, folk tales. Uh, you know, in, in that area. And um, in a nutshell, you know, it takes place in a small uh, village surrounded by mountain back in around like 18th century. And it, it, the theme is about kind of like uh, their, um, uh, the nature and human. And then there are some like, you know, um, like a mystical figure that appears in the film that was in many old folk tales. And, and then, but also, um, but uh, uh, in a nutshell, it's kind of like a witch hunt story. That's, mm -hmm. um, and then um, by that, I was, I'm hoping to touch on like some um, like group mentality of, you know, Japanese people. And then, and then how the main character kind of like uh, breaks out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, our first question from the audience is from Frank Chance. He notes, I really enjoyed the use of music in the film, both traditional and modern music and performers and even a bit of rock and roll. Uh, can you tell us about the process by which you made your musical choices? Musical choice, well, as far as I like, um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, as far as a traditional, you know, Ainu music, you know, it's, the music is a very, very important part of their, uh, their culture. And, you know, and then I, you know, I found it's, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And then I, so I wanted to, um, um, you know, put that element in the film as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so, so it was always there, that traditional one. And then, and then meanwhile, the main character Kanto, you know, he he doesn't really practice traditional Iron music. He plays Chuck Berry, and then you know he and then the inspiration for that was because he watched Back to the Future with his father. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he 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 now he's what uh, sixteen years old. You know, mm -hmm. when we shot the movie, he was like fourteen. So you know, so he's a he's a regular kid. You know, he mm -hmm. who just likes movies and then you know what you know likes rock and roll music and then so he so before i started you know making the movie he was already forming the band with his friends you know playing this you know chuck Berry, you know johnny be good you know song and so that was so that that was always you know also there already and then i saw it was fantastic mm -hmm. and and because again you know i never wanted to um like how to how to call it um like overly romanticize, you know, who they are or like, you know, like put the, put the different, um, uh, uh, un, you know, unfair, you know, portrayal of, you know, of them in, in the movie. So I thought, you know, how this young kid, you know, playing rock and roll instead of, you know, practicing uh, traditional island music was, was wonderful and then says a lot about who they are now. Mm -hmm. And so, so those elements are already there. And then as far as, um, um, newly composed music. I worked with uh, a New York based musician, uh, Clary Stenson, uh, who, who has a wonderful uh, talent and career. And, and doing that, it was, it was, um, so she was, oftentimes it was played with the live sound or like sometime even with like an Ainu, traditional Ainu song. So, she, so the uh, finding the, you know, uh, good balance was very, very, um, tricky, but she, she did a wonderful job. And then, so, well, in the process, we, we had many conversations, of course, but the main reason why I wanted the external, you know, music also was to really 
um, add layers to each scene, you know, um, instead of kind of um, not to just like tell, okay, this is how you're supposed to feel, but to add another layer. So, so that, so the story and the feeling and then the tone, you know, expands, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, Faye Beecham asks, could you tell us how you came to focus on the killing of the bear and the relationship of the boy's loss to, uh, and its relationship to uh, the boy's loss of his father? Yes. Um, so the fiction part, um, so that's one of the main, uh, I guess, like a fictionalization in the film. Mm -hmm. Like the, the bear ritual called Io Monte, uh, the last time it was done is back in 1990. And, uh, and I mean, like back in the day, it was, you know, was practiced every year almost. And then, and after uh, back in like 1950, something like Japanese government banned the ritual. Mm -hmm. um, and although they still um, held it, you know, like, like, you know, 60s, 70s uh, to kind of preserve their culture and then mm -hmm. um, tradition. And today, there are many different sides to about this uh, ritual from outside the community, from inside the community. Mm -hmm. And after, as I you know, heard uh, different uh, views uh, towards this ritual within the Ainu community, I thought you know, this um, diverse voice, you know, uh, uh, voices uh, is you know, really kind of uh, say a lot about how they, you know, um, try to maintain their identity, and then what are the what are the um, challenges they are they are facing, mm -hmm. and so it's and then of course the Iomante itself, you know, it, it contains so much about uh, uh, Ainu's uh, philosophy, culture, and you know, spirituality and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was really the diverse voices that I wanted to highlight uh, um, and in the film. So through um, you know, um, may, choosing this uh, this ceremony as part of the story, you know, I could you know show these different sides. You know, like for example, like in the main character, uh, you know, fourteen years boy uh, old boy, Tanto, uh, never really agreed to do it. Although finally, you know, at, in the end, he kind of came to uh, terms with it. Uh, but I never like. For example, like say, you know, uh, you know, never say, you know, like, like this is a good thing or a bad thing, or never uh, try to avoid a kind of, you know, any like kind of uh, judges, you know, on, on that on the ceremony because I'm not in the position to do so. Right. But uh, but what I wanted to do is to again like highlight the voices, um, mm -hmm. and then also his father was kind of again uh, how to it was a way for me to connect the main characters kind of, um, um, you know, uh, inner, you know, a journey mm -hmm. to that ritual. Because mm -hmm. uh, if you watch the film, uh, you will see how the father and then the, the, the ritual are connected uh, mm -hmm. in, in the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, Kenya Avandano uh, notes, it's very cool that you studied abroad in the Midwest because it's where I live. <laughs> um, she, uh, they asked, did the indigenous populations of Minnesota influence your perspective? And if not, what were some big parts of your experience in the U.S. that influenced your filmmaking? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, many things living in the U.S. Uh, influenced me, uh, not just as a filmmaker, but uh, as, a, as a person. Um, mm. I think I definitely became a lot more aware about um, different voices. Uh, and then the importance of uh, listening to uh, those voices. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think I would have ever, I shouldn't say ever, but like probably it's, it, um, I don't have, I probably wouldn't have made a film about Ainu if I only lived in Japan because I wouldn't have that kind of perspective. You know, I wouldn't have see that importance of it really. Uh, or, you know, it would take a much longer time maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the the presence of indigenous people, uh, um, I felt in while I lived in Minnesota, definitely um, made me. That was actually the the initial um, how to say uh, um, inspiration. Inspiration, yeah, experience that 
made me to realize that, oh, okay, I'm from Hokkaido and then there is an indigenous people called Ainu, but I don't know anything about them. Mm. And then that's not, uh, I, I should. And mm. so, and yes, in a way, you know, it, it, it took, took, you know, um, many years until I finally started working on the film. Mm-hmm. But the, the seed of it, the project was actually started in, uh, in the experience of living in Minnesota. Mm. So um, Ayaka Yoshimisu uh, asks, I enjoyed Ainu Mojir uh, very much. I was struck by the use of the bear's POV shots, point of view oh. shots. Could you tell us about why you made this choice? Does it reflect Ainu culture in any way? Yeah, thank you for the question. It, it's a bit of a spoiler <laughs> for the people who haven't seen the movie, but it's okay. Um, so it has a lot to do the, um, so the idea of the ceremony, the bear ceremony, it, you know, in, in, the in, the, um, the idea behind it, it's not, it's not about killing the bear. So it's, a, so the practice is, so finding a bear cub and then raising it for a year or maybe sometime two, and then, uh, um, sacrifice it, you know, um, uh, in the end. As they, but they are not in in their idea. They're not killing the bear, but they are uh, because they see um, in 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 the in the traditional idea there is a god, you know, within the bear. And then after killing the body, the the god inside the bear's body will go back to the god's run. So for them, it's so raising the bear is spending time with the god within the bear, and then you know killing the bear is sending the god off to to its world. Mm-hmm. So, and then, so after they kill the bear, they have a ceremony and, and then inside, inside the house, and then they have all the food and then, you know, like, you know, eating, drinking, singing, dancing all night before they uh, send it off uh, in the next morning. Mm-hmm. And, and during that party uh, part of the ceremony, um, they, there's an idea that the, the, the God inside a bear uh, is sitting on top of the the bear's head, and mm-hmm. then so the so so there so and then the god is enjoying the party. So mm-hmm. so the POB was to uh, uh, a way that I try uh, to to tell the idea uh, visually. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, Don Gale uh, asks in discussing the ceremony. You mentioned the importance of nature in Ainu culture and philosophy, which is one of the things that really came through in the film. I wondered whether the Ainu people were comfortable sharing their culture, philosophical and religious beliefs. Did you get a perspective beyond what is usually shared with the public? Beyond what is... Um, well, first of all, like the, um, whether they were you know, comfortable or not. I mean, like I, you know, again, you know, they, they were, you know, I try to get them involved as much as possible through, from the development process. Mm-hmm. And, and again, to avoid for me to um, impose any preconceived, preconceived ideas or, or uh, make a, um, a wrong portrayal of binary people in the film, Mm-hmm. I closely worked with them and uh, from the, you know, screenwriting process. And then also, you know, when, again, you know, when we shot the movie, we, they were free to say uh, what they wanted to say, um, aside, you know, aside from what I wrote. And so on that note, you know, there were, if they were uncomfortable, they wouldn't have been in the movie. If they wouldn't, mm-hmm. you know, they wouldn't have supported the movie. Um, so I assume they were comfortable and then they are, from what I know, they are very happy uh, with the film. Mm. Um, aside from what they share beyond the public, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't, I can't think of anything specific. Um, mm. but, uh, but the, more than anything, you know, it's, I think, you know, as I said earlier, you know, there, there's, there's never enough to, you know, um, uh, as far as like learning about you know uh, one group of people, and then you know I, I I hope to you know continue the learning process you know as as I stay in touch with them, mm-hmm. but um 
but of course, you know, there are traditional, you know, ideas and, and um, perspectives and philosophy, but at the same time, there are also, you know, modern people living in today's society, just like us. And then there are uh, each and every one of them have a different ways to, to embrace their culture, um, you know, or, or how to, how to, you know, live with it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, they, they just frankly, you know, say to me, you know, um, you know, I don't know, you know, how to speak my, you know, my own language. I don't know, you know, any song or dance, but, you know, I'm, you know, I identify, you know, myself as Ainu and then mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's all I need. And then, mm -hmm. and obviously that's okay. Perfectly. Okay. And then, mm -hmm. so, so again, what I, what, I guess, I, I guess I saw and then listened or heard many, just like, um, voices as as um you know as a as a regular person you know just like us and then that's that that was um and then that can kind of like broke many um you know preconceived notions mm -hmm. i didn't think i had mm -hmm. so well for our final question today uh dustin mcgladry uh, asked do you feel that with this film that i knew can now take control of their stories and create their own films I mean, they can, they're, they're always in control of their story mm -hmm. and they can always make films if they want to. Mm -hmm. I mean, today there's no known filmmaker of Ainu, mm -hmm. but, you know, of, you know, of course there are, I mean, it's, I mean, to be honest, like that, that kind of perspective is already kind of, um, sounds a little bit, paternalistic to me because I, you know, I admire who they are, admire their voices and then admire, you know, um, I mean, of course there are, um, it, it's, a, it's a sensitive thing. And then, you know, I should always be careful uh, to not anything do wrong um, mm -hmm. as far as, um, you know, like bringing their voices out into a, 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 a particular medium like film. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, they are, they are always, you know, uh, sending their own messages and then expressing themselves in, in various ways. You know, sometimes it's maybe it's hard to, uh, for the public, uh, general public to reach. But mm -hmm. if they uh, listen carefully, they are, you know, you know, always, you know, uh, telling their stories in their own ways. Mm -hmm. So, well... Thank you so much for that. And we've come to the end of our time. Uh, very deep thanks, uh, Fukunaka-san, for joining us, especially so early in the morning in Tokyo. Um, thanks also to members of the JSA board, uh, to Dawn Gale in particular, and Jody Dietz and Sarah Bayos, and Isaiah Reesby of the JCC CoLab uh, and the University of Kansas Center for East Asian Studies for their support. I know folks out there are very interested in what the JSA is planning regarding Hokkaido. Uh, I don't have any new information for you now, uh, but I feel fairly confident that we will have a formal announcement to make at the time of our final program uh, in our series. Uh, the link to that program is actually up on the JSA webpage, japanstudies.org right now. Uh, May 14th at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, our own Maggie Ivanova will be talking to Julie Lezzi, a professor of theater at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Uh, they will be discussing her presentation of Remotely Kyogen, Comedy Under the Virtual Stars. Uh, the production is currently running, and if you're among the first to register for it, you can also catch the final performance of Kyogen uh, via Zoom this Sunday. So all the information you need can be found on the JSA website, that's japanstudies.org. Uh, and so thanks once again to everyone for joining us today. Thank you again, uh, Fukunaga-san. Uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.